my guest served as the finance minister in the previous government of President John Mahama. He's recognized as a technocrat whose approach is widely seen as not unduly influenced by party and ideological considerations. What does he make of the lack of continuity in the area of public policy and economic management? Back in a moment. Mr. Seth Tepe, welcome to Time with David. Thank you very much. Mr. Tepe, you were finance, deputy finance minister, then finance minister. You've been in this business for quite a while. Yeah. And uh, now you are, if you like, uh, out of government. What is it like for you um, to have been so involved in, in, in frontline politics and, and suddenly find that you have to observe what others do, especially in, a, in an environment where sometimes we tend to lack continuity of policy? Uh, yes, thank you very much. I think I like to put this in a context um, between, because um, what is the line between policy and politics? Um, that's a context which I like to talk about. I've been a public, um, an international public servant for a very long time. Uh, in fact, my whole, I would say virtually my whole working career has been, you know, with, a, with a public service, public services. I started my career um, in the Ministry of Finance, specifically National Revenue Secretariat, uh, working with uh, my former bosses who happened to be uh, both policy and politicians were Professor Mills, to mention a few, Mr. Toa Ahoy, and the late Ibisata, the late um, uh, Victor Salome. These were the people around whom we were working, you know, in the ministry. Like I said, you've been around for a while. Yes, and I opted precisely. So I opted for a long time to be, you know, in policy. Let me interrupt you briefly, just before you go on. You seem to be making a distinction between politics and policy. And I can see that coming from you. In practice, do we do that? There's a thin line, you see, because uh, policy should inform politics. Right. And, and, um, and but politics then you go a bit back back to, and then you go back to ideology. Right. So if my ideology is market-oriented, then I tend to believe in free, you know, market, uh, the markets, in other words, demand, supply, the private sector, you know, are relatively free, less regulation. If I come from a left of center, you know, your approach, different. approach, then your policy tends to be one where the state, you know, has some More <clears> important, some to play. important role to play yeah. in development yeah. and in social intervention, yeah. particularly for low income people. And then you say there's nothing like a free market. Mr. Tepe, you know, do you say these things and I hear you? I'm just saying in reality, because it sounds just conceptual, you are saying to me, do we really have a difference in this country when it comes to these things? Um, not even in many advanced countries today. And let me, because um, much ideology and much policy is tampered with uh, pragmatism. Right. You know, when you're in office, you know. The reality uh, hits you. The reality, yeah. So, and, and that's where policy advice becomes you know, very important. So, so are you telling me that there is not much of a difference between, say, the NDC and the MPP in terms of policy, ultimately? On certain things, very little difference. On, on certain things. Um, but you finish the thought and I'll come back to this. So if you take um, globally China, you know, which uh, communist states to different approach. something, yeah, different approach, you could see their yeah, approach. Few people know that they many Chinese institutions are in the markets, and that's where they make their money. That's where they get their money for their development. That's the pragmatism you're talking, is that the that's pragmatism? the pragmatism I'm talking about. So it's not the state that gives all the money to China Development Bank. It's not the state that gives all the money to China. So what do they have, a mixed economy? These, no, these two institutions, as an example of which we are familiar with in Africa, are rated, just like any Western institutions, like USSM, and they're in the capital markets, raising money. Right, bonds. So what is the point you're trying to make by that? Well, the point I'm trying to make is um, ideology, politics, policy. Uh, it's often tempered if you want to make progress by a pragmatic approach to governance once you, you're in policy. And you can see that with some leaders like uh, Tony Blair, you know, moving Labour Party from a hard left, you know, to the middle. You can see that with Clinton. You know, similarly, and you see many 
uh, rightist governments, you know, who have moved more towards using, you know, government. So back home, uh, you can see even, even though most people talk about Kwame Nkrumah being, you know, socialist and all that, well, he never confiscated, you know, private property, was not invested in the states. Uh, he went to the World Bank, the Americans and others, for much of the money for development. So it was a pragmatic approach. So let's characterize over the years, okay? What kind of position have we practiced, if you like, over five to six decades? I mean, Whenever, put aside the military regimes. I mean, as civilian governments, I'm quite curious. What is, what, what is your reading? What have we done? What have we opted for? Well, let's, let's look at our parties. You know, we all know by now that um, the two dominant, uh, you know, coming from the... Uh, in Krumah's, you know, tradition, and then you have the Danko Abuze tradition. Right. In a global context, you will say that the Nkrumah's tradition is left so more left, left and, and right. left of center. Mm -hmm. And this one, which comes back to the market orientation or a bit of state intervention, which saw state institutions, uh, Gihok in particular, leading development. Yeah, you saw many social, you know, policies fast track to today. And that has, you know, now virtually been embedded in the MPP and the NDC as, you know, the uh, coming through the Rollins era. Uh, and as you said, we had our military. But even if you look at our military leaders, you could see whether one military leader is leaning more towards the left and beliefs or more towards, you know, the, you know, the right. Or Does it matter? Does it matter? Does it matter all this lean to left, lean to right? Does it matter? It matters because... Um, How does it matter when, when, when we are aware, for example, that the MPP in many parts of its, of its times has pursued, if you like, what people attribute to social democracies, big social interventions, the kinds of things that yeah. you would associate with left of free, free SHS. Free SHS is a good example. Yeah. That is um, not... Right one district, one policy. factory being you know, an example yeah. with the state... How do you explain that, Mr. Tepe? Some of that is... Uh, inevitable that the state has to, you know, to come in, uh, but it's the extent to which you go, as you said, which makes a left of center government look more rightist or and vice versa. But I say I would also say that it matters for practical reasons, uh, because one, they come from traditions. Two, um, globally, that is the division that you have. So you have. Um, the Socialist International, and you have right of center governments, even if they are practicing, you know, uh, virtual socialism, how attending. How can you say they have that even if they are practicing something else? I mean, you cannot do that. Well, you you just, are either this or you are that. Well, we just spoke about pragmatism, you know, being pragmatic. You call that pragmatic. So, so pragmatism as in what? As in, you, 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 it's very interesting that you use, you talk about pragmatism. I, it's, a, it's a term I've always been curious about. So pragmatism means what? You put aside your principles or your beliefs uh, so that at the moment where you are, you can do what you need to do, correct? No, the way I'll put it is uh, if you are left of center, you're right of center, and you are known for that, and, and that is your agenda, um, then you should also note that the state has limitations. You should also note that the markets have limitations, and therefore, um, it, it shouldn't be, be, be seen as though when you come to power, the state is going to give, you know, everything to everybody, you know, or the markets are going to be the solution to, every, to everything because you have private sector people who are greedy, they have private sector people who would, you know, who would corrupt the system, you have private sector. So the market in which they operate is not always a perfect one. Mm -hmm. And that's why, therefore, you would have to bring in regulators. But it's a sense to which you go, you know, so it doesn't define. But the point I'm making is that, um, like it or not, parties in many countries, especially when you have two strong parties, uh, tend to fall into that divide for okay. one reason or the other. Okay, let's move on, Mr. Tepe, let's move on. Um, let's look at Ghana, Mr. Tepe. Let's look at uh, uh, the way, you know, policy in the area of economic management has evolved. I mean... It seems to me that what is critical is that policy has a certain coherence and continu con you know, continuity so that over time you can achieve those things. Don't we undermine ourselves the way we operate? Because sometimes it appears that when governments change, 
that continuity is lost. Yes, it's lost. But the interesting thing is that two, three years down the road, you see backtracking. You come back to the same place. Because you see some backtracking. Because then you have to make a correction. Because you see that, you know, the path is not, you know, and that there is a certain policy dimension, and this is where policy becomes important. And there's a certain developmental dimension which, you know, would not change. But why do they deviate in the first place? Only to backtrack. What causes that? I would say sometimes it is um, using a system operating in a certain way. You see some deficiencies with it. Maybe let's say, I wouldn't say as, a, as an ideologue, but as, as somebody with certain principles, as you put it, you think that you know, those principles should come in to prevail. Uh, so people tend to see too much regulation. They tend to see too much of government interference. Uh, and so those who, from their education, remember many of these things we are talking about transcends politics. Yes. Because we learn them in school. We learn them in, and, and you begin to see them reflecting positions. Who is going to be a mixed leader? Who is going to be an SRC leader? You know, and then you see inklings of this, you know, coming up and whatever, and uh, within families, you know. So I come from the Dankwa Buja, you know, tradition. I come from the, you know, um, but even within family, you get somebody who would say, no, I, you know, I belong to say the Puma's family. So uh, over time, people tend to have an orientation on policy, an orientation on life. And so when they are not in power and they see things, you know, there's that natural edge that maybe if you are closer to our principle. So then in campaigning and other things, that is what you, you, you project. So you are not in power now. You are not in power now. So what do you see? What, what is your reading, Mr. Tepe, of the, 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 success, the successive government and how it is managing you know, public policy, especially in the area of economic management? What, where, what do you support and what, do you, what would you like to see done differently? Um, so this, this, this is also like... Um, is it a question? Is it also... No, I mean, we should, we should be, I mean, for a program like yours, we, we, should, we should talk about, about it this things. Uh, but I'm saying that my answers may come across as also defending, you know, some, you know, Mahama policies, yeah. you know, which... You but know, that's I just, okay. I just Those are the viewers, policies that you... Precisely, I just want viewers to understand, understand that. that, you know, yes. Yeah. But, you know, you, if you take, for example, let me use specific examples. Um, if you take fiscal management, right, and um, over the last 30 years, right, we have had debates over the tax structure, right? And um, um, some of the leaders, you know, in the current administration, for example, were involved in the value-added tax debate, right. Kumi Preko, and all that. Um, I think 30 years on, or 20, sorry, precisely for about 20 years on, but maybe closer to 30 years for other tax reforms, uh, in coming out with certain policy measures, even if you had a position, right, on VAT, if Ghana is not the only country with VAT, you can't be stuck in the past. What have other countries done? Because VAT has been the tax which has been implemented, you know, from barely five countries to over 90 countries now, you know, changing their general consumption tax regimes. So you may want to see. So if you come in and begin to disrupt the tax structure, the VAT structure, because to give you an idea, I don't want to be too technical. What makes VAT unique yeah. is that it says the tax is on the consumer. Right. But we know that production takes place and it goes through what you call the value addition stages. Somebody brings in raw materials, uh, the manufacturer takes it, he manufactures a product, the wholesaler takes it and stores it, and they, that's how you are adding the value because they cost is incurred, my profit is added. So you are adding, and then you come on until it reaches, by the time it reaches the, the, the consumer, the commodity has gone through imports, it has gone through manufacturing, it has gone through um, wholesale, retail, it could be large retail, before small retail, before it gets to the consumer. That's fine, what is the point so you're the, making the about The point I'm it? making, you know, in terms of policy consistency, yes. and not changing, and using this as an example, is that what is the objective of VAT? What is the objective of sales tax, which VAT replaces? Right. It says, I want the consumer 
to pay a tax on the product that he's buying. Ideally, therefore, you collect the tax at the retail stage. But your retail stage is in the informal sector. It's not well organized. So that's why. So you then know. you go back and you say, okay, importer, customs will collect part of it. But that's putting the burden on all it. That, that's, that, that overburdens a particular sector, doesn't it? No, but, well, most, no, most businesses act as agents for collection of tax, whether it's income tax or. Okay. So let's look at it in that role. Okay. So customs collect from the importer, and then the importer sells. Remember, if you don't recognize two things, if you don't recognize the VAT as a tax on the consumer and not on business, right, then if you don't do anything about the manufacturer who is buying from the importer, he will add the VAT collected at the port to cost. It will go into the cost, and then it goes to the uh, wholesaler who would also collect uh, VAT, Retailer will collect VAT. So you see the tax multiplying. Yeah. How so, what, so the policy is simple. The policy says for as long as you are not the consumer who has to pay the tax, any VAT you pay on your inputs should be given back to you. How is this government's policy then different from the, the previous government? The difference is this. Get fund and NHIL. Get fund and NHIL are products of Kumi Prakumi. They are products of the resistance to VAT because the VAT was to be introduced at 15%. After the Kumi Prakumi demonstrations and everything, one of the biggest concessions that was made, and the sales tax was 15%, you know, to increase to 17.5%. So you see why the VAT has ended up at 17.5%. Yeah. Yeah. So one of, the biggest concession, no, one of the biggest concessions that was made for the VAT to be introduced was to implement it at 10%. Okay, so, so in getting to the 15%, we said, let's increase it by 2.5%, but dedicate the revenue from that 2.5% to get fund for education. Ghanaians love the education, so who would oppose it? But the reality is that get fund is a VAT. So get fund was being implemented, we are talking policy here, yeah. was being implemented as though it were VAT, which means that when you pay get fund on your input and you are not a final consumer, you are giving back a credit. Yeah. Fast forward, the Kufu administration comes and also adds 2.5% and, and calls it national health insurance. Yeah. Right. Now, so, but the policy consistency that we have had, irrespective of whether you are in favor of VAT or you are opposed to it, is that the governments recognize that we are implementing a VAT, but we are calling it by a different name. Okay. Now, this administration comes yeah. and blocks that input tax. You see where policy consistency comes in? So this is policy, <coughs> policy inconsistency. Policy inconsistency, play. exactly. Yeah. And now, businesses are coming out, and they are openly saying, because the uh, input tax, the credit I should have got has been blocked, I'm increasing my cement price, I'm increasing my... But they, the government the has a right to pursue different policies. It, has, it, it, it didn't actually have to continue what the previous But the question is to what end? Because if the goal was to collect that tax that is being blocked as additional tax, go to the fiscal tables. It's not increasing. Because when you increase taxes, what happens? You encourage evasion and avoidance. OK, let's move away from VAT so we don't get stuck in there. Yeah. Tell me, what other area of, if you like, economic policy? And I want us to. You know, I'm really good. Let's take development. It. Yes. Let's take development. Okay. And, and that's, that's the difference. What, 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 you tell me what, how you perceive these things and how, what you think we could be doing differently. Well, one of the things we let's take free SHS. Right. You know, the Mahama administration's approach was progressively free, free education. And that approach says, let us take, you know, the schools to the communities, but let's do it progressively because it's costly, you know, to, and then you can also be adjusting gradually. So we started the e-schools, you know, which e-schools were to go to, you know, communities, 200 e-schools, which were slow, reduced to... Slow, slow. Um, what are you going to achieve with that? Wasn't that a bit too slow? Don't you find this government's policy much bolder to take the bull by the horns and say, look, this is what we are going to do with it? Some the resources were there. No, something, no, the resources were in there. But Remember, what, no, you based, 
we are using oil resources predominantly. What is, wrong? What, what is wrong with that? What is wrong with that? Except After all, people chop the money. This no, is being no, used uh, properly. Uh, then there should have a boldness in saying that, in making the promise that I'll use Sankofa. You know, money. I'll use ten. So, so what did they, how did they? How did they? How did they? Well, the, the assertion was that we are going to raise our revenue. We know how to raise revenue. You know that statement. Yeah. You know, we've yeah. worked in Bank of Ghana. Yeah. We know how to yeah. raise the and revenue. And you're saying that in the end they did not do that. In they the, just relied on the oil revenue. Yeah, but when you take the oil revenue, you see the approach. The Mama administration was using it for infrastructure. You know, because infrastructure also leads to development. You know, and part of that infrastructure is the e schools. And get fired. But you cannot, right. you cannot underestimate the importance of investing in I, your human resources. I mean, infrastructure no, is we, important. No, if we, if we underestimated it as a government, we wouldn't have the progressively free, free education. So the difference is in quality. So let's look at what has happened over the last three years, right? This is the third year, right, of free SHS. The, fun, the first students who came in free SHS have continuity, right? Next year, they are going to the universities. Did you hear anything in the budget about the free SHS students who are going to the university? Did you hear about infrastructure being expanded in the universities to missing. take them? Yeah. You know, because we are going to get, because the cost of free SHS has become mm -hmm. very expensive, right? To the point where if you are beginning to use, through the borrowing that was done to promote it and all that, you are using uh, together with wages. And by the way, if you expand it, you need to increase wages, teachers and others over. To, to date, we are using 90% of tax revenue, more than 90% of tax revenue to pay wages and interest. But if it comes from oil no, revenue, you are producing almost 200,000 barrels of oil now. How is that possible, that when there was even less oil, you could fund it? Now you have <clears> even more. I think that's where the pragmatism comes in. You know, that's where the pragmatism comes in. The pragmatism uh, meaning the pragmatism what? That you will not being, use? No, the pragmatism being the reality is that Ghana is a developing country, even though we have become a middle income country. And so? And, and not even in the United States of America, right, at a point you start taking loans to go to school. Is this new? But then it is concerned. Is this new? Is the idea of but this free education, is it new? It's not new. Well, is this the only country that has decided that free No, there's a qualitative difference. Well, what is the difference? The difference is that in many countries, when you talk about free education, it's tuition. It doesn't include, you know, say, boarding. It doesn't include... So you and think... So in the United States, no, yeah. so in the, yeah. in the U.S., for example, as in the U.K., which you may be familiar with, your kid, your zip code, your area determines where your kid should go to school. And the secondary school is there. And it's there. Right? That's why they are So your argument is that the infrastructure is no, there. If and you existing. want to take your kid to another facility where boarding and whatever, because remember the point is access and quality access. So you have the schools, you have teachers, and you say the kids, you have, you have a lot of schools, you know, in the community, two, three, and they have the option depending on your zip code. If you want your kid to go to a boarding school or something, then you have to pay for it. So, Mr. Tepper, tell me, let's assume that the NDC won an election. Are you telling me now? I mean, here we are talking about the importance of policy continuity. Now, hearing what you say about uh, free SHS, I take it that if the NDC was to come into power, they would, they would, they would treat it completely differently. Is it's that correct? Not, it's not easy. And, let, let's, and this is where governments get stuck. Um, let's go back It's not to, easy to do what, to change it, to change, No, no, it's okay. not easy to just okay. cancel it. I want to understand. Yeah, it's not okay. easy to cancel it. The, the, the good thing is that the NCC has an alternative, which is a progressive fee free, which is, you know, to immediately increase the number of schools in the community so that you stop, you know, the long distance travel. And the resources you know, for that would come from where? Because the resources for expanding the school network. Because you are prioritizing school infrastructure and teaching you know, and you are going to be reducing feeding. And the resources will come no, from where? The it will be the same resources, but you are using the resources more efficiently. Because, uh, let's give you one example of what we had in mind. If you go to West Africa Secondary, which we may be familiar with, it's a big campus, right? You could have put two, three more, you know, classroom blocks, and through school busing, which is done in the US and the UK and other places, the kids will come from home every day. And once they are in school, they eat breakfast because they have to start 
you provide them with lunch. Mr. Tepe. And, it's, and it's, it's, it's a cheaper course. You don't have boarding costs. You don't have, you know, you don't have to equip a whole boarding school with, you know, yeah. uh, with all the costs. You don't have to feed Feeding times, everybody you know. and all that. This is the additional cost, you know, which that cost will then be a substitute for the, for, for more youth schools and for more, which is a Kwame Nkrumah approach, remember? Yeah. yeah. He started, you know, the government schools from Ghana National to all this, many of these schools to make a, and so I'm saying that, you see, we are going back, we may end again, policy consistency, yeah. Kwame Nkrumah, yeah. had we continued the consistency in providing school infrastructure, yeah. we would probably, and the reason I'm saying it's not so easy was, remember single spy. Right. The, the, I mean, the, administration, no, the administration administration couldn't just say this is too much for, for the budget. Right? So let's just cancel, cancel it. it. They couldn't cancel it because it's a commitment. You so see, where is it now? And when one government makes a commitment, well, we finish the migration. So where is it now? Uh, single, single spine. spine. Yes. Oh it has been it has been integrated. Integrated. Yes. By the time we're leaving office, and by the end of 2015, and that's how long it took. And the government has kept it and it's working well. Yeah, because of course. It is, okay. it is uh, yeah. yeah. The, the issue is there was a need to increase public sector salaries. Right. No question about that. Mm. And I've been a long time public sector, mm. right, before mm. I mm. <laughs> got into politics. Mm. So let's, let's accept that there's an agreement on mm. that. Okay. The pilot was what went wrong, right? Okay. But by then, a lot of commitment had been made. So okay. you just had to, to do it. And so the whole forum, the Takradi forum, you know, said this is the reality. Labor right. was there, everybody was there, there's a dialogue. Okay. And I, I, I suppose a similar thing is going to happen. In fact, President Mahama has already called for a national dialogue on free SHS. It's mm -hmm. going to happen. Let's talk about the budget, annual budgets. Mr. Tepe, what does government spend most of its money on? It's, it's, it's easy to answer this question because um, it applies to all governments. <laughs> it's just a degree. Okay. So uh, much of the taxes that we pay yes. going to paying salary, salary yes. for state public, public workers. Public yes, public workers. And when you talk about public public servants, you are not talking about only the civil service. Yes, you know, which is the service. ministries. Yes, the but you are talking about universities. Yeah. You are talking about you know. Yeah. So okay, so you now have the you are, sorry, you now have the call civil service, which is still in existence. Right. But now you have education service. Yeah. You have health service. You have local government So service. Much, the, much the money goes so to all, all of Yeah, all of them put together. Yeah, what, what percentage know, we have of, to pay? Yes, what percentage of money goes towards that? I think um, at, at the peak of single spine, um, we, we came out with a number. 70% of our tax revenue is that, I mean, was going into, yeah, into yeah, wages. Tepe, and, and that's OK? No, it's not. And that's why you have to do a rationalization. And luckily, luckily we had oil revenue, so we'll come to that. But if you were to rationalize, where would it go? No, but I'm saying that if development, because it's, where? it's where? development. Be, so what? What I'm saying is, can only be at this. So let me give you the scenario. Okay. So when you use, let's say, I just alluded to the fact you have your tax revenue, right? But the total revenue is made up of your tax and right. the non-tax. Okay. The difference is grants. The non-tax is grants, fees. So when you add fees and grants from outside to your tax revenue, then you have revenue. Uh, but the key one is tax revenue, because ultimately you can't depend on largesse. Tax revenue? Yes, which is a tax, income tax that you pay, or you pay, when you, when you pay wages to your workers here, mm -hmm. you know, in this studio, mm -hmm. the accountant withholds tax. That's the first, you know, popular one. When you, as a businessman, you know, markets, you know, what we are doing now, and uh, you, you, somebody comes to take adverse and the rest, and the accountant again calculates the profit you made. You know, after deducting your expenses, then you pay, because you're a company, you would have incorporated, your, you pay corporate income tax. Mm -hmm. And then you pay, those are the direct taxes. They fall directly on the income. We have royalties and the rest, which are also. The second category is taxes on goods and services, mm -hmm. you know, which is import duty, which is on only imports that are coming to the country. It hasn't got a domestic equivalent. Mm -hmm. And that is why we say that import duties or tariffs protect local industries. Right. And then the next one, 
Largest one, the actually. Famous vid, the, famous, the famous vid. The famous vid. Yeah, you knew where I was going already. I know you were going for vid. <laughs> this, this magical vid. You know, that's a, the thing about the VAT is that it is indiscriminatory. Yeah. Once a commodity is taxable, it yeah. doesn't matter whether it's imported yeah. or it is. And then it moves through the value chain. That's let's what talk, we're talking about. Let's talk about development. And I'm sorry, the yeah. other last one, major yeah. one, is excise. Okay, excise so duty. So these are many houses. So, so in terms of development, where yes. you are going, I'm yes. saying that yeah. when you collect... The revenue, when you collect your tax revenue, you add your, you pay wages yeah. as a matter of priority because of us as Ghanaians need a public service. Uh, you pay uh, interest and you service your debt because, you know, your revenue is never enough to meet all your expenditures, so you borrow. So you pay that. And then you pay for the cost of running government. Which we normally call recurrent expenses. That's 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 this this too it's much. Only when you too have much done, money goes into that. Yes, exactly. It's only when you have done that. Yes. That you have money left for. The Do government. you agree that too much money goes into running government, Mr. Techman? It has always been with many countries. Why? Yeah, but why? You keep well, one, talking about many reason, countries. Yeah. No, one, one reason is um, everybody wants to work in government. Most people want to work because what is convenient, it secures your job, you get in, you don't misbehave, and you know you have a job. Do you believe in small so government or big government? I believe in small government. You believe in small government? Yes. But when you, but that, but, but when you don't have employment and there's pressure, then you, you, you use government. Recruit, yes. And that is where, again, the ideological or philosophical differences Something. come in. And that is, we say, therefore, that, you know, for example, um, if you use beyond 60% of the revenue, yeah. beyond that, to pay wages, recurrent, then you won't have, the more you use. Yeah. So when we go to 70, um, say beyond uh, 60, it means that you were, you were cutting, it was, okay, the difference was 40%. Yeah. When you get to 70, 30 now. 30 now. When yeah. you get to 80, 20, 20 now. now. And to date, as I said, we are almost at 90, so it's 10 now. That's because we have a 10 left, left for what? For development. Let's talk about That's for, for roads. So when you say development, you know, for, you're, you're talking about roads. The sectors. You're talking about the different sectors. We're talking about the different What are sectors. the key sectors they in, are your, in your estimation? No, first of all, remember yeah. the sectors yeah. are also led by the public, public right. servants, some of the sectors. For example, Cocoa Board is a, is a state institution. And even though Cocoa Board raises its money and, and pays, you know, so and pays itself. It's, it's not on the budget. It's so not, let's, not. let's pick one that's on the budget. Yeah. Uh, Ghana Highway Authority is on the budget. You know, environmental protection. Could it also be off the budget? These ones you mentioned, can they also be off the budget? Like well, if, you, if we, that's where the winning of, there are some of them who could generate revenue, yeah. you know, to be off the budget yeah. and pay for themselves. Yeah. Uh, but the point I'm making is, so if you give a bloated public service, mm. it can only be at the expense of the money you need to do roads, to do hospitals, to do schools. So the, the, the more money you spend on the, on the public service, the big <clears throat> public service, the less money you have for development. It's not just public service, because remember, if you move, and this is not to some part some, but if you move towards free SHS, and you are adding to the cost of feeding, you are adding to the cost, it's part of the recurrent expenditure I was talking about, because the secondary schools are all part of the public, 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 you know, yes. And so the question is whether you want to spend, you know, the money in increasing infrastructure for day schools so that, you know, you don't spend much on the, on the, on the, what you call recurrent. I'm looking for yeah, recurrent. You know, recurrent expenditure. That is the expenditure which mm -hmm. the recurrent is the expenditure which does not leave anything visible. That's fine. Let's talk so about we yeah. use it to to feed students and okay. let it disappears. Yes, yeah. So let's talk about infrastructure. We use it a lot in this country. I mean, governments. Everybody talks about it. Oh, these people did very well and it's with infrastructure and all that. When we say infrastructure, Mr. Tepe, what are we talking about really? I mean. But tell me, what, what is the priority infrastructure? Because clearly the roads are only one bit. You can't do everything. Yeah, and that's how would you prioritize? You see, that's exactly the point I'm trying to make, you see. You, know, you certainly can't do everything, Mr. Tepper. So what would you, in your view, what do you prioritize? Let's, let's use, let's use uh, two examples. First, let me use roads. So certainly, you can build roads instantly to every village. Right. But what you can do, you know, which 
we attempted to do, following the U.S. example, when they open up the U.S., is to have your Eastern Corridor, Central Corridor Road, Western Corridor Road. We have that. And then you have the Costa. We have it. We have it. You have the Costa Road. Yeah. Then you have the Middle Belt, which you join. And yeah. then you may have one. Yeah. And that becomes, you know, those who are familiar in the U.S. become your interregional or interstate. Absolutely. Highways. So that's, you look at the yeah. country and the link. So to we do have the roads. We don't have that. No, we don't have some of them. Mm -hmm, but not all of them. And you don't have... Because you have roads that connect east to west, mm. north to south, and whatever. Mm -hmm. But like the US, they are not highways yet. Why? You see, you hardly. Why? Well, we've been doing Why? them. Why? We do so. I mean, look, this road to Kumasi, ages I have traveling on it. There's always some peace being done. When can we have a road that begins here and ends there? Do a card wave, finished, done. What, what does it take to do that, sir? Well, the, 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 maybe that's, that's a subject for a longer interview, but, but let me try and just give you two difficulties. For example, you know, when, you know, I was involved in raising money today, you can, you know, most, in the U.S., for example, if you are moving on any of those highways, they are told. You're paying for it. Yes, because the tax alone will not be able to, so you pay for it. Can so we do that here? Yeah. Uh, we should. Why don't we? I mean, no, no, that's the reality, okay. but that is where ideology comes okay. in. You ah. can't do everything free, right? There's a cost. Okay. That's the point, right? So, so, that, so, so your, your, yes. your, your, your party is therefore even, your government will even be more guilty because it is left of center. So then you would want to do roads free. Tolls. I mean, yeah, it, is, like, it is rather the right of center government that is willing to toll. No, no, just like you go to left of center, many left of center governments and government in other countries who had to face the reality and the that reality. the budget revenue is not enough. Reality was to charging. To do all of that, exactly. And uh, so you pay a user fee. Give me an example. And so a motorway. Give me an Motorway. We should be able to plow back. We are, we are told but, to do the, but look the plaza. look at the shape the motorway is in. <laughs> I know I, I, I started it to give you, you know, because it's linking, you know, and then you do. Okay, so. How, how can you tell me that tolls are going to develop the roads when the motorway is a good the, example no, of a toll road the, and it's in no, sack portion? If the tolls are high enough, yes. right? Ah. Remember, there's a lot of cargo right. that moves from the port. So if the tolls are high enough, but if they are ring fence, if the money is ring fence, right? And remember, we started a ring fencing approach. Yeah. Terminal 3 is ring fence. Uh, let me give you the philosophy. Terminal 3 is, was based on the airport tax. Okay? So the airport tax started with the old Terminal 2, mm. right, which was the international. And then we said, if we build Terminal 3, it will bring in more, because we saw a niche. We saw airlines come in from 5 to then 15, 20. By the time we're leaving office, 30. So we needed a new airport, new terminal. We said new airport. That was pump prop, but you couldn't raise the money immediately. Remember, we had come out of Hippic and all, you know, yes. So we said, OK, why don't we use this philosophy, which is, you know, uh, make a projection of how much all these airlines moving faster and more airlines coming in would add yeah. to the airport tax yeah. travel. Yeah. So we ring fence it. Yeah. And, right? and you use and those ring resources? Fences, we, we, yeah, we projected it. The yeah. African Development Bank and the banks found it credible that okay. the revenue can pay for this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and by the way, Nkrumah used the same thing. The same approach. You know, the revenue from Baku okay. and others for that. Okay. Okay. that okay. I, I asked you yeah. about infrastructure. You went but straight to But let me go to the second, yes. The just second before one, you went to roads, why yeah. didn't you talk about power? I was just why? going to power. My two examples, you know. so. If you talk about prioritizing, yeah. right, uh, we started prioritizing energy. Yeah. Remember, because we found oil. Yes. <clears throat> we found gas. Okay. So we said we will not flare gas. Mm. You know, like some countries. Mm. So CDB loan comes in, right, to build the pipeline. Fine. And to build a turbo plant yeah. so that we can take the gas. Fine. And today we have more pipelines to Sankofa and right. whatever. What infrastructure did we need there? That is the pipeline infrastructure, right? So you have a, a, a sector that is coming up new, so you have to prioritize this and look at its potential. And then the east-west pipeline that was just completed, which we had envisaged, which will move the power from Takrani to Tema. And the badge and others move into, so that they generate power and then you bring it, because the industrial base is Tema. Are we on the right track with that? We are on the right track. The right track with the power business? Yeah, we, we, we are, except that, as usual, 
you know, cost. ECG is not bringing in. Because when you generate the power, somebody yeah. has to. But we've been talking about it. ECG. You see, this is very interesting, sir. You're not saying anything new. Isn't that, does that not disturb you? I mean, are, how do you feel? I mean, no. No, but we are, are no, but we are back to where we started. That's it. The what? consistency of policy. That's the, the, the inconsistency in this the, case. Well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's some consistency. Because yeah. PDS yeah. was, yeah. remember, yeah. was, was the part PSP. of the plan. Yeah. yeah, it was part of our plan. That has been messed up the, completely. You know, but that's the point I'm making that sometimes we, you know, we, 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 we come in with things we can do things differently, yeah. all the parties, and then yeah. you come back to square one. Yeah. And that's where the consistency, we would have made more progress. And hopefully, as our mm -hmm. democracy matures, yeah. I would hope that the middle class will lead this discussion. Yeah. You know, what and discussion? then the next time. What discussion? Discussion then, about? We are going to another campaign, you know, so uh, I would hope that we will be more perceptive when somebody says. The I discussion can raise, about policy consistency. Yeah, so. Policy consistency, but also promising that I can do everything free, free, yeah, free. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's, it's just impossible. <laughs> Mr. Tepe, what do you make of the wide-ranging reforms that this government has carried out in the financial sector with the banks, microfinance companies, savings and loans? I mean, it's shaking the system up quite a bit. What, what, what in your view, accounts for it? What do you think of it? It's continuity again. I mean, the point is, uh, the impression is given that it's, you know, it just started. We, we actually started. If you remember the Energy Sector Levies Act <clears throat> that was passed, one of the purposes of that act was to raise you know, funds, you know, to streamline, you know, the banking sector. And we did a first restructuring, actually, uh, which is debt owed by Water River Authority and other energy, you know, um, companies uh, to the IPPs and then the borrowing that they had done at the bank. So we used 215 million of the initial flows from the ESLA, as we call it. Um, <clears throat> we did that as cash injection, and then we took the loans which were the books of the banks, which um, owed, to, owed by VRA and the institutions, 2.2 billion. And we extended it to the five years at the time, what we thought, how long it would take. And we used, therefore, the ESLA to support it. And it, it gave the banks a breather. So I think it's a qualitative difference. Um, so why, why, is all, why was all this necessary? Then? <clears throat> well, because again, we are coming to uh, um, uh, beliefs, you know, um, I believe in a big bang approach. There's something wrong, you know. Let's just go big bang and and do a correction that shakes and makes a major impact. Is that not a Versus good thing? No, but, Don't uh, you need solid banks to manage major transactions? I come to and... pragmatism again because um, for two reasons. First of all, remember even again in the U.S. where you know institutions are solid, the financial sector is solid. Remember during the financial crisis when it started. Yeah one bank was brought down, which is the Lehman Brothers, you know, actually two banks. In the, in, the, in, in the UK, it was a Royal Bank, and it shook the system, and they stopped. They stopped the collapse of banks. They stopped the big bank approach. And rather, they used what they call quantitative easing and others, <coughs> you know, to resolve the problem. Quantitative easing. Yeah, but not that it, because it was linked to other factors. Right. And right. ours is also linked to other factors. But by the way, um, we had experience of DKM, which was just a microfinance company, you know it went into the campaign and all that. And the resolution of a microfinance and how it shook particularly one region tells you that you know you can't just you know compare to the big banks, you know, where the philosophy was do something wrong. But the other reason is that the debt that is owed to the banks and their inability to raise revenues, let's not forget, forget that we came out of the power crisis which again, one word was used to describe it, and therefore the underlying factors you know, were wished away, but they didn't go away. One, we had a breach of the gas pipeline you know, from Nigeria, and we're not getting gas. VRA had to import crude. At the time, crude prices were very high for the thermal plants, which is why the restructuring started with VRA. The economy itself was low, right? Because if you don't have power, you know, and you are not producing, or you are producing at half the time, you know, and laying off workers and all that. If you take a loan, it's difficult to pay. So there is something that is tied to the economy, you know, and so, and then thirdly, we lack a capital market. We lack a deep, we have a capital market, but we lack a deep capital market. Would you have done it different? That's my, that's or you wouldn't have, so you wouldn't have done no, it at all? No, we started. I said, no, I said, yeah, so, so you agree with what they've done, I'm saying, with the closing of the banks? Again, it's the approach, the big bank. What approach? What? The approach is a big bank. You know, yes. Let's say 
you can raise 400 million. So yeah. Yeah. Or we find yeah. you know, malfeasance and whatever, forgetting employees, depositors, you know, the impact on all of them, right? And this was our first experience. The non-performing assets recovery trust was about the banking sector. And everywhere it is shown that the impact on the economy when you do a big bank approach is, it takes about 10 years. So they shouldn't have done a big bank approach. Well, that's their, that's their decision. That's their decision. We are seeing the effects. And then and ours would have been, and, and let's not forget, ours would have been from, and in fact from VRA with, you know, the same ESLA had a component for contractors. What's ESLA? The energy sector levy. Okay. You know, with an act, which was yes. a law. What is the link between the <clears throat> energy sector and this bank thing? I mean, simplify well, this. I don't, I don't understand what you're saying. Well, okay. We, we, we said, um, when you bring the banks, you know, down immediately, you need money to inject into the banks which is often comes down to the risk because the banking sector is intertwined with the economy. And so governments come in when it gets to a certain point. Mm. You know, so one approach is you take the bad bank, the bad uh, debt, you put it on what you call a bad bank, and then you give the banks money. And that was where they levy, the revenue come in, and then gradually, you know, you, you, be, you begin to resolve, you know, the, the issues relating, and you give, therefore, the owners and the rest time to raise, you know, the So money. you think their approach has just created too much turbulence, too much unnecessary disruption in people's lives? Well, we should have known, because that's exactly what happened the U.S. and others. You know, it created turbulence in Europe and everywhere, yeah. and they decided to do, to go more progressively. And this applies to the microfinance institutions and the savings and loans as well? It's only, it's even compounds it, you know, yes. And, um, but we, we've seen the, you know, it, it's, there's only like black and white. You know, there may be some advantage, heavy borrowing, we are told, in addition to the levy, which has just been increased, right? Um, we are told that we are spending, you know, about 15 billion Ghana cities already, you know, injecting, you know, money into, uh, the cases are in court, the malfeasance and others, uh, some are contesting, you know, and, and it leads to all of it. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't have punished malfeasance, because after we did the audit. Yeah. Administration did the audit that is being used and the recommendations. But again, let me emphasize, it's a question of approach and how you resolve it and how you learn from the experience of other countries in resolving your problems. Mr. Tepe, I'm wrapping up. So what do you do these days? You are a former finance minister. I see you at various... For, uh, I mean, um, what is it like to be out of power? Out of job. You're out of job? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm uh, no, over no, the no. years. You can be out of job. <laughs> yeah, much of what, yeah, back into consulting. Yeah. I do, you're back into consulting. I do some, yeah, some consulting, which is uh, what I was doing working. The IMF job is, you are, you are an employee, but you tend to advise countries and all that. And you so, come back into government if your so, party comes to power. You're going um, between private government and consulting. That is, that's left to the president. That's right? left to the president. Who, who, yeah, who is still moving. But the thing is to support him. Yes. You know, yes. since it's our policy that has taken. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you coming, sir. Yeah.